Bob Mueller is now circling the people closest to Trump, including, yes, the family. His son-in-law and senior government advisor, Jared Kushner, sat with Mueller's team for a second time. And here is the news on that. This interview, we're told, lasted over six hours. Kushner's lawyer is speaking out about it tonight, which itself is important. He's telling NBC the client answered every question, focusing on the campaign, on the transition, which we know was a period of contacts with Russia, and sanctions questions. We also know that there were questions about the activities post-inauguration, including something at the beating heart of the obstruction query. How and why? was James Comey fired. Kushner, a key figure. He's a lawyer in his own right. He's someone that was with Trump, of course, from the start. And he's been involved in many defining moments. You can't forget, obviously, the secret Trump Tower meeting with Russians, which is under investigation. Kushner attended, along with other family members like Trump Jr. and Paul Manafort, who, has been famously noted, should have known better. Kushner also worked on that alleged secret back channel to the Kremlin, a question that Mueller wants to ask Trump about. Directly, that we know from the New York Times leaks earlier about the continued wrangling over that potential interview. And then last summer, consider that after speaking to congressional investigators, Kushner did something that you almost never see him do. This remains one of his iconic and only statements about all this. He came out and addressed those cameras in front of the White House. Let me be very clear. I did not collude with Russia, nor do I know of anyone else in the campaign who did so. I had no improper contacts. I have not relied on Russian funds for my businesses. And I have been fully transparent in providing all requested information. He took no questions in that setting. You can imagine that Bob Mueller's investigators may have asked, what did he mean by the word relied? And was he ruling out taking any Russian money at all, given the question swirling around, yes, Trump lawyer Michael Cohen. Today, the BBC reporting sources in Kiev say Michael Cohen was paid $400,000 by Ukraine to try to get access to Trump. Now, let's be clear. Those are new and separate legal problems for Cohen. If you followed this story at all, you have heard us talk about the foreign lobbyists. There are rules already in place that they have to register with the feds. If you don't, you are violating the Foreign Agents Registration Act, and that alone can get you charged and convicted. Now, Trump met with the Ukrainian president last June. That was after Cohen received the secret payment. And shortly after that meeting, Ukraine announced they were dropping an alleged investigation that was going to go on into Trump's former campaign chair, the now indicted Paul Manafort. He was in court today. You can see we're following a lot of threads, making requests that lawyers do make to try to keep some evidence from that early morning raid of his home out of the ongoing proceedings that Robert Mueller has against him. So a lot going on. Mueller making moves against Trump's inner circle. And now we're seeing some new developments out of Trump land. Rudy Giuliani, get this, says that maybe getting foreign help, which is ipso facto illegal, wouldn't be illegal if it were kind of a friendly gift. Look at this in the Huffington Post. Rudy says, it isn't illegal. It's sort of like a gift, and you're not involved in the illegality of getting it. Nothing illegal about that. And even if it comes from a, from, a, from a Russian or a German or an American, it doesn't matter. And they never used it, is the main thing. They never used it. They rejected it. If there was collusion with the Russians, they would have used it. We have quite the panel to dig in. Former DNC chair Donna Brazil, who has also been in the mix of some of the results of the hacking. A former federal prosecutor, John Flannery. He was a special counsel in three separate congressional probes, hence the bow tie. That's a sign of gravitas. Tim O'Brien, the author of Trump Nation, executive editor of Bloomberg View, and he has the distinction of having been sued by Donald Trump over his reporting <laughs> on Donald Trump's net worth. And a friend of mine who has been on the show before, Stephen Brill, is a celebrated attorney. He is the founder of Court TV and the legal journal, The American Lawyer, and he has a new book out, Tailspin, because Stephen Brill never stops working. Uh, we will get to you in a second. I begin with John Flannery on Giuliani's defense. Why does it sound so stupid? Is it as stupid as it sounds? Well, you know, the Howdy Rudy show has been uh, running now for several weeks, and he doesn't seem to get any smarter about what he used to know as a prosecutor. I knew him as a puppy prosecutor in the Southern District, and I thought he was one of the leading legal minds. And I suppose so many years in politics is sort of I don't know, deteriorated his insight, or he's doing what some lawyers do, which is he's making political arguments. He's trying this in the media, 
Mueller's not doing that, and when Mueller drops his bomb, none of this stuff is going to matter. So on, on a scale of 10 <laughs> being a slam-dunk legal argument and zero being worthless, <laughs> your assessment of this new gift defense? Is minus imaginary numbers. <laughs> Stephen? Absolutely. I mean, he's basically admitting that, uh, that they took something of value from a foreign entity. That's, and that itself, that's what the law says you can't do. Right. And that itself tells you what? Uh, that it's a violation of the law. I mean, a gift means that, you know, the, uh, the only thing that means is that the Trump campaign didn't pay them for the stuff. Well, no one ever assumed the Trump campaign did pay them for the stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tim O'Brien, a thing of value is what is barred under the federal election law precisely because we have regulated campaigns, which means you can't get endless amounts of money, even if they're gifts. In fact, especially if they're gifts, in-kind contributions are an area where a lot of politicians get tripped up. It's also worth remembering in the same interview today, Rudy said uh, that you had to doubt whether there was Russian interference in the campaign to begin with and that he doubted the information because it came from Brennan and Clapper. And today, Trump's own Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, <laughs> conceded that it was a reality that the Russians colluded or the Russians attempted to interfere in the interfere, 2016 yeah. election. A member of Trump's own administration is now confirming this. So Rudy has to try to make this stuff be viable against a landscape in which it was known not only law enforcement officials, but to the Trump campaign, the people were concerned about Russian interference. So they get these emails right at that moment. Right. And, and, and Donna Brazil, uh, I always mention and disclose uh, that you both bring expertise to this from being involved in it, but you also bring that, that personal background, not neutral on this issue. Uh, but you remember uh, how devastating the timing of the political release of the emails were. Let me read more from Rudy on this today. He says, with regard to this, you say stolen, I say emails that were put out in the public domain. You'd also have to believe U.S. intelligence was correct. They've been right about a lot of things. They've been wrong about a lot of things. I certainly wouldn't try trust Clapper or Brennan as far as I could throw them. Uh, your response, uh, Donna Brazil. Well, let me just say respectfully that uh, the, the former mayor, he has it all wrong. It, it wasn't a gift in, in, in the sense that uh, someone provided. The Trump campaign wanted this information. They wanted to use it in such a way uh, that would sow division within our, the Democratic Party, but also distract from the daily, what I call, uh, insane campaign that he was running. We all know that these, uh, not only the release of the emails, the stolen hacked emails had an impact uh, on our party, but the way in which the Trump campaign used those emails in the fall campaign, almost as if it was talking points. Hmm. So uh, I, I would hope that we uh, continue, that uh, Mr. Mueller continue this investigation follow the evidence. This is not about the, the calendar. This is about following the evidence so that we can prevent this from happening again and learn more about what happened in 2016. Uh, John, I wonder what you make of Abby Lowell, another lawyer that I, I'm sure you're familiar with, who's yeah, represented... Say yeah. again? I said he's a friend of mine. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, and he's <laughs> been on this show, and he's respected for his legal acumen. He uh, had a victory in the Menendez case, and he's here defending Kushner. And he seems to be out on offense today, as I mentioned, speaking publicly uh, and, and really making the case that they have a story to tell, that these six hours they spent with Bob Mueller uh, were <laughs> essentially a good thing and that he got a security clearance. Uh, and that's in, contra in contrast to what Rudy was saying, uh, about people like Jared Kushner, about, you know, in-laws. Yeah, we take can give a, him take, up. Yeah. Take a listen to the in-law item. Jared is a fine man. You know that. But uh, men are, you know, disposable. <laughs> John. Well, I'll tell you, you know, Rudy throws everybody under the bus. Um, he throws uh, Kushner under the bus. He, he th certainly threw Cohen under the bus with his uh, bizarre... Uh, confessions with Sean Hannity. But, uh, uh, you know, Abby Lowell is pushing hard, and you have to wonder sometimes if a client hasn't insisted on uh, speaking. I have never considered it a good thing to have a client in a criminal investigation who hasn't been assured that he or she is a witness or has immunity to talk, and to talk for six or seven hours or whatever it was, what, in what appears to be the closing days when they're tying knots into their Well, let me, uh, let me push you on that, John, and then I'll go to Stephen. Uh, sure. You're making two points. One, it might be 
a bad thing, especially as you get to the end. You get to the ninth inning, you don't want to be the last guy or gal in there. <laughs> On the flip side, though, you, you, you can't say that it's bad to cooperate. What else was he going to do? Oh. No, 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 no. In my neighborhood where I come from in the South Bronx, if the cop on the beat was your uncle, you wouldn't have talked to him. And uh, it's almost never a good idea in any criminal investigation. But when you have public figures and politicians, they always insist that they want to talk, which is almost always the worst thing they can possibly do in an investigation. So if you're not assured that your client is merely a witness and you don't have immunity for your client, it is almost always a mistake hmm. to put them in there. And these guys have been investigating. Why do you think the first interview was three hours and this one six or seven? Do you think they were doing that to clear him? Well, I don't think on. so. John, yeah. maybe they were just talking more slowly. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Prosecutors uh, uh, from New York can speak slowly. I can tell you, here on the set in New York, zero laughter on the set. Zero. I mean, just not even <laughs> any. Uh, I will None. say this. John raises the legal point, Stephen, uh, about what is the status of Jared Kushner. And a lot of words get thrown around there. I have a brand new statement that was just handed to me because a lot's happening tonight uh, that Abby Lowell has basically put out where he says the kinds of questions they asked, referring to Mueller's team, the statements they made reflect that, quote, they understand Kushner as a witness to these events but I don't use those terms, end quote. <laughs> Abby Lowell trying to thread a needle to suggest his client's a witness while not able to factually claim well, that Mueller said that. Go ahead, sir. I, I read that to say that he asked them, you know, can you assure me that he's not a subject or a target? And they said, no, he can't. Yeah. That's the only mm -hmm. way to read that. You know, if he had been told he's just a witness, he would have said, I was told he's just a witness. That's a great point. Uh, Donna Brazil, uh, what is your view of Jared Kushner as a, a kind of a newbie to politics who's in the thick of everything right now? Uh, I wouldn't call him a newbie to politics, but I, I, I can tell you this. The fact that he received his permanent security clearance today after revising it multiple times, the first time, of course, he omitted the fact that he had contact with foreign, mm -hmm. quote-unquote, uh, individuals. So, look, I, I think that Jared is more than just a witness to some of the things that happened in 2016. We'll learn more once the investigation is over with. But remember, he took credit for the social media campaign, the digital campaign. And now that we know the role that Cambridge Analytical played along with Facebook, we need to know more about what Jared did do, uh, and not just witness, but what he actually did during the course of the campaign. Uh, you know, by the way, we don't know that he wasn't offered and given um, immunity and accepted it. Who said that? Oh, well, you they know, don't, they haven't disclosed any the great immunity thing about, we don't know. You know. The great thing about, you know, the entire Mueller operation is they don't say anything, they don't leak anything. So for all we know, <laughs> he was given immunity. And the other thing looming all over this still is 666 Fifth Avenue, which remains this sort of financial boondoggle for the Kushner family. And we know that Jared was out lobbying foreign investors during the transition and, and shortly before the inauguration to help him get funds. That remains an unresolved issue about what all of that involved. Right. And who could have predicted that a, a address 666 would have any kind of bad luck? John, <laughs> take a listen to uh, one witness uh, who knows a bit about this talking about what Mueller's most interested in. It starts with people's contact with the president. I'm in the middle of the Mueller investigation, right? The very first thing when, when Mueller brings you in there, one of the very first things he wants to know is your conversations with the, uh, with the president. Conversations with the president. That's uh, uh, Steve Bannon there, and he is also making news claiming uh, today uh, that Rosenstein might be next to be fired. John, your, your view on <laughs> both of those. Well, he's not exactly a reliable source either, but I don't think it takes uh, more than a sixth grade education to think that in this uh, conspiracy, and I don't call it collusion, this yeah. conspiracy, that the quid pro quo for the president being elected is that he's going to take care of those who helped him get elected, whether they started in 13 or 14 or 15 with the machinery to conduct this message on his behalf, reassured that he was the candidate uh, for the Russians. So. Uh, you would focus on him, and how could you not focus on him when the, the last thing that happened before the investigation began was that he fired Comey for investigating him, which is an abuse of due process, in my opinion, an abuse of his oath, and a crime of obstruction. Hmm. So I, I think it's pretty obvious that what we're doing is carefully building perhaps more than we would normally have to do because of uh, such a, a public official so visible and considered by the office to be substantial when the occupant is not worth that kind of dignity. You don't think Donald Trump is worth the dignity of the Oval Office? Absolutely not.
Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.